Hello, and welcome to this Nature Research Custom Media webcast titled Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry Characterization of Max and Maxine Samples, Achieving Atomic Depth Resolution for Small Particles. My name is Nikki Forrester, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is produced by Kamika. We'll begin the webcast with a presentation from Dr. Pavel Michalowski from the Lukasiewicz Research Network. We'll end the webcast with a Q&A. To ask a question, just type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit at any point during the webcast. We'll do our best to answer all your questions. And now over to Dr. Michalowski. Hey, thank you for a very kind introduction. I'm very happy to uh, deliver this talk. As you can see, the subject is secondary ion mass spectrometry characterization of max and maxin samples. Uh, in particular, I would like to uh, present uh, how to achieve atomic depth resolution uh, in for measurements of uh, such a small uh, particles. And the results of this uh, work has recently been published in uh, Nature, Nature Nanotechnology. Uh, it was cooperation of two research groups. Uh, one, it was Materials and Devices Characterization Research Group from uh, Łukasiewicz Institute of uh, Microelectronics and Photonics. And the second one is, was uh, Nanomaterials Group from uh, Drexel uh, University. Here you can see a list of all co-authors of uh, this talk. Uh, so during the, my presentation, I would like to show you the exact results, the, the information we obtain about the materials that we characterized, uh, but also I will, uh, would like to present in detail uh, how it was possible to, to achieve such accuracy. Uh, it is, of course, um, discussed within this, um, uh, within this paper, uh, but I would like to also show you the process, how it, uh, how it was to, to uh, optimize this measurement procedure. Uh, and it actually took me five months from the very beginning when I received the samples from the nanomaterials group uh, to the final results that I'm going to present you right now. Uh, at the very beginning, I would like to make a very short introduction to the samples that we'll be uh, discussing today. So uh, Max and Maxine samples, particularly the Maxines are very um, important right now. This is a family of two-dimensional uh, ma uh, materials, transition metal carbides, carbonitrites and nitrites. They were discovered quite recently, 2011. Uh, by group which uh, included Professor Yuri Gogotsi, who is also a co-author of this work. Uh, and basically, uh, these materials are synthesized from a, a max phase, as shown on this uh, diagram of here, uh, by a selective etching of the A layer, which is in many cases uh, aluminum, but it can be also other elements as listed here. And after the etching or uh, the lamin and the lamination, we end up with two-dimensional uh, structures uh, like this with varying transition metal carbides, uh, carbon and nitrogen in between, and some uh, termination layers. Uh, here on this plot, you can also see that uh, these materials, although uh, they are relatively new, uh, recently discovered, uh, there are already many possible uh, applications of, uh, of these um, uh, structures. Uh, okay, now I would like to introduce the secondary ion mass spectrometry technique. Uh, maybe a little a longer introduction is uh, this technique is usually not as well known as uh, Maxine's nowadays. Uh, so here you have a, a schematic drawing of the technique. So basically, um, the principle of the technique is that we bombard a sample with the uh, primary uh, ion beam, as shown here. And these ions are causing a lot of phenomena occurring within the uh, sample. So first of all, as you can see, these primary ions start to collide with atoms from the sample. They transfer part of their energy into these uh, atoms, knock them out from their stationary position, uh, and so these atoms start to move on their own. Uh, and in turn, this atom will further collide with other atoms from the sample and also transfer the uh, kinetic energy and set other um, atoms in motion. And so we generate something that we call a collision cascade, as schematically shown with these uh, black arrows here. Uh, 
obviously, when we start to bombard a sample with this primary ion beam, we'll also start implanting this primary species into the sample. So it has to be taken into account that if we want to monitor a specific element, the presence of a specific element within the sample, uh, we should avoid using the same element as a, a primary ion uh, species. Uh, the most important part of the technique is that part of this energy that these ions transfer to the atoms from the sample uh, comes back to the near surface region, and so this sputtering process may uh, occur as shown here. Uh, additionally, part of these sputtered particles, usually this is a very low number, typically less than 1%, are additionally uh, ionized. Uh, so these are actually the secondary ions that are included in the name of the technique. And now when we perform a mass spectral analysis of these uh, secondary ions, we can obtain the information about the compositional um, the composition of the, uh, of the sample. Uh, there are, however, some more phenomena that are important to, um, to uh, mention that are making the interpretation of the results a little bit more difficult. One is the preferential sputtering. It's schematically shown here. So basically, it may happen that uh, when we have two different types of atoms in this layer, it may happen that one of them can have a drastically different probability to be sputtered from the sample than the other one. So this will lead to formation of regions, as you should see here. Uh, that is, we can see a clear agglomeration of one type of atom and depletion of the other one. Uh, so basically, uh, it means that when we see such a result uh, that we can see some agglomeration, uh, we may already think that some kind of a, a process happened here, some kind of a segregation. Whereas in reality, it may happen that this was a measurement artifact caused by the technique itself. Uh, so it has to be remembered and um, verified whether such agglomerations are actually the uh, artifacts or realistic uh, features. Uh, and the other one, the uh, really very uh, important uh, thing that's making the interpretation uh, quite difficult is a mixing effect. As you can see, when we set these all atoms in motion, they will start mo move around the sample. Uh, you can see that uh, in general will uh, push more atoms uh, deeper into the deeper regions of sample. But uh, as you can see here, we can also uh, extract some atoms from deeper layers towards the surface. Uh, so the mixing effect is, of course, asymmetrical. We definitely push uh, more atoms deeper into the sample. Uh, but it can occur in both um, in both directions. Uh, okay, so these are just very basic principles. So as I said before, we usually obtain the elemental, we want to obtain the elemental composition of a sample. And it is important to emphasize that in most cases, we do not get any information about the chemical state or at least some minimal limited information. Uh, this is because this ionization of these uh, elements is artificial. This is caused by uh, primary ion bombardment. So sometimes I do get some requests uh, whether you can check whether this uh, metallic atom is uh, in oxidized or metallic states. And the uh, answer is no, I can't do that because I will uh, ionize this, uh, this element during my analysis. So I will not know the status of it, the chemical uh, state of it prior to my analysis. Uh, as you can also he see here, the uh, bombardment uh, of a sample is causing the erosion of it. So it will start to form deeper and deeper crater. And in this case, we can only not only monitor the elemental composition of the surface of the sample, but we can also see how this composition is changing uh, with the depth of a sample. So in this case, we can create a so-called depth profiles. Uh, nowadays, most SIM spectrometers are also equipped with uh, position sensitive detectors. Uh, so in this um, mode, we can also register not only the depth of the uh, atom where it was originating from, but also X and Y um, uh, the, um, directions. Uh, so in this case, we can make the lateral analysis uh, of the surface of our sample. And when we combine it with the uh, depth profiling, 
we can obtain fully three-dimensional uh, images of our sample. Uh, in most cases, SEMS is used to uh, check the stability of layers, so whether they are, uh, the interfaces are um, very exact as shown here or whether they are blurred. Uh, it's uh, very well used for the uh, monitoring of the diffusion process, and this can be done both uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, and most important, at least in the semiconductor industry, is the analysis of the dopant and uh, contamination. This is because uh, SIMS has, uh, is very well known for its excellent detection limits. So in most cases and in most cases, in most elements, uh, the detection limit better than one ppm, uh, it's almost always granted and uh, quite often is uh, much bigger reaching one uh, ppb or or even uh, even better so the technique is uh, definitely uh, very well spread in the semiconductor industry uh, but this is not typically uh, used for 2d materials this is clearly not a, the first technique uh, to come to your mind when you are thinking about the characterization of these materials. Uh, but as you already know from the uh, title of my talk, I'm my, uh, I would like to apply this technique to 2D materials. So now I would like to discuss you how it is even uh, possible uh, to do so. Uh, okay, so for, with this, I will first introduce you the instrument I'm um, using for this uh, experiment, which is uh, Kamika EMS S Ultra. Uh, so uh, there are two very important innovations that uh, differentiate this uh, instrument from other uh, SIMS um, instruments. So the first is the application of extreme low impact uh, energy technology. So basically, in most spectrometers, uh, you can't really go down freely with the impact energy of the primary uh, ions. And this is because first you may lose the output of this, uh, of this ion gun. So the intensity of the beam will be very low and the sputtering process will be very uh, inefficient. Uh, and second, when you start decreasing the energy of the primary ions, uh, the quality of this beam will start to deteriorate and uh, will make the, the measurement uh, quite difficult to perform. So in most cases, uh, 500 EV is the lowest value. Some spectrometers offer 250, but it already starts to be a little bit unstable. Uh, here, Kameka uh, used two, two different uh, columns. So both uh, uh, I would, the instrument I'm using is equipped with the uh, oxygen and cesium primary ions, and these are two separate columns. Uh, and in the case of the first one, the oxygen column, uh, for the uh, gas ions, uh, gas guns, uh, usually it's duoplasmatron that is used. And here there is a radio frequency plasma generator. And the main advantage is that when we start decreasing the uh, energy of these ions, we do not decrease the uh, intensity of the beam. And in this way, we can go down with the uh, uh, impact energy down to 60 V. Uh, in case of the cesium column, uh, it's a little bit more uh, tricky to, to, to decrease it to such a low value as 90 EV. So basically, we still apply a very high voltage to the accelerator uh, of the uh, cesium source. So it can be well above uh, 1 kV. But then we additionally apply the floating voltage to the column itself so that we can decelerate this, gradually decelerate this uh, cesium ions so that in the end, when they are reaching the sample, they and their energy can be as low as 90 EV. Uh, this change uh, is very important when we are thinking about this uh, aforementioned mixing effect. Because in this case, uh, these primary ions carry so little energy that they don't have much to transfer to the atoms from the sample. So these atoms cannot move long distances uh, into the sample. So the mixing effect is really reduced in this case. Uh, however, it wouldn't be enough if not for the second uh, innovation that Kamika used. It's, it's how they form the, uh, the beam itself. So normally when you generate the primary ion beam, its shape is uh, Gaussian, 
And so as you can see here, the middle part is more intense than the edges. So when you start thinking about how such a beam can sputter your material, it's quite obvious that this middle part will go a little bit faster than the edges. So in this case, you will integrate the uh, information, the signals that you are obtaining from like, I don't know, two or three nanometers. Uh, and of course, in the semiconductor industry, it's typically enough to, to, to do so. Uh, but in the case of the 2D materials, it's obviously not good enough because the thickness of uh, 2D materials is well below uh, one nanometer. It can be, they can be even uh, atomically thin. Uh, so obviously you can't really make a very precise measurements with the Gaussian uh, shaped beam. Uh, but in this case of the, this instrument, uh, we still generate uh, such a beam because it would be very difficult to do otherwise. But then this beam is projected on a pair of square stencils so that we only cut the middle part of the, the beam as shown here. So then the uh, working spot on the sample is, as you can see, rectangular and very, very homogeneous. So in this case, we do not have this problem of the blurring of the signals because of the Gaussian shaped beam. Uh, so these innovations are very important to uh, to work with 2D materials. Uh, however, uh, they are not uh, not uh, enough. Uh, so when you start applying such a low impact energies, uh, you will sacrifice a lot of the intensity of the signals that you are registering. So in most cases, uh, you will have to increase the integration time and it will actually decrease your depth resolution. So, uh, so just just these two innovations are not uh, not enough, and for that I established something that I call the dedicated measurement procedures. So basically, we can think that there are two different types of procedures. One is uh, standard or universal; they are provided with the equipment when you are purchasing it from um, from the provider, and the second is the, the dedicated ones. So here is the very short. Um, pictures showing the difference. The uh, standard or universal procedures are optimized in such a way to maximize the total amount of register uh, ions as shown here with this uh, green cone here. Uh, so we do uh, get a lot of secondary ion signals, but without any thinking about the different types of the uh, atoms that might be uh, present here. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, with this uh, spatial distribution of this red and blue um, ions, they're uh, very different from each other. So when we maximize the total amount of ions, not caring about which uh, specific ion it uh, is, it, uh, we obviously we go, go obtain a lot of very high intensity signal of these uh, red ions, but just a few counts from these blue ones. So the dedicated measurement procedure is actually taking care of it because we are actually focusing our extraction parameters in such a way that we maximize the output of the signal that is most relevant for us. Uh, and if we have more than one uh, atoms to, to, to monitor, which will be definitely the case here, we'll simply switch them uh, as it goes. Uh, the drawback of these dedicated measurement procedures is that they actually work only for this specific sample and this specific elements that we want to uh, measure. So when we are changing, even from 2D materials, that from graphene to boron nitride or molybdenum sulfide, or of course, maxines, uh, each time you have to use different dedicated measurement procedures, whereas the standard ones are, as said, universal, and you can use them for all different kinds of uh, materials. So this approach is obviously time consuming, uh, but as you will see soon, um, it's well, well worth it to, to do so. Uh, okay, so let's now uh, to go into um, uh, to the main subject of, of uh, my talk is the measurement of max and maxins samples with the SIMS uh, technique. So the first sample that I uh, intended to measure was the max phase, the titanium free aluminum carbon two. Uh, as schematically shown here. And from my experience of from different um, 2D materials like graphene, boron nitrate or molybdenum sulfide, I already set the impact energy to 100 AV and use a very high incident angle. Of course, we measure it from the 
uh, normal from the to the uh, sample surface. So uh, these ions are coming from the like a uh, grazing in sedan. Uh, why did I choose uh, these parameters? It is because I knew that for such, this is, let me emphasize it, very non-trivial um, conditions for the sense uh, technique. But in this case, uh, I intended it to work like this, that these primary ions will only interact with the uppermost atomic layer of the sample. So they will start eroding the only the first titanium layer. And then only after some time when uh, most of this layer is already eroded and the second one is exposed, they will, it will start the sputtering of the second uh, layer, which is uh, carbon in this case. And then after some time when we start sputtering um, carbon, when we erode most of the carbon layer, we only then will start uh, reaching the second titanium layer. Uh, and this, of course, continue and continue. So in this case, it was my intention that it should actually um, ensure the atomic depth resolution that even though there is some overlap of the signals right here, uh, I was hoping that it should be possible to distinguish each atomic layer. Okay, so let us see how it actually worked. So when I received the sample, I said this... Um, uh, conditions and my very first attempt was like this uh, okay i know uh, it may seem that i'm trying to build up the tension that first i showed you the axis and then with the next uh, step i will show you beautiful curves but no this is nothing like this this is actually my first result obtained for the uh, max sample so as you can see i didn't register anything at all uh, please note that I already include also the oxygen signal because right from the beginning we thought that it will be very important to monitor uh, the oxygen uh, contamination with this, uh, this sample. Uh, okay, so that was uh, not the very successful uh, start of this uh, story, but it is not fully uh, surprised for me. Uh, because the conditions that I aforementioned are not very typical. So I thought that, okay, most probably this extraction of the secondary ions uh, didn't work quite well. So I decided that, mm, okay, we need some very fine tuning just to see whether we can adjust this extraction a little bit to, to obtain this signal. Uh, sadly, it didn't work at all uh, as well. So... Uh, I still couldn't see anything uh, from uh, the sample, not a single count of any of these uh, signals. Um, okay, I spent quite a lot of time on that point. Uh, and at some day I got a little bit frustrated. So I tried even uh, very rough and not so fine tuning. Uh, okay, uh, don't worry about this video. I registered it a little bit uh, later and I wasn't actually changing any voltages so that's drastically as shown here. This is just a little joke, uh, but to show you that it didn't help me at all. So I was trying to scan a really, really uh, a wide range of parameters to obtain some signals. And I still got nothing. And uh, it was really not just a few minutes uh, as it is now when I'm talking. It really took me days and even weeks uh, that I was not able to get a single count of these uh, signals. So um, trust me, it was really frustrating at that point. Uh, but I also, um, I have a saying that the frustration actually fuels the determination. Uh, so I was really determined to to uh, to work with these samples, and after failing to get anything, I was starting. Okay, I need to think what's actually going on here, and they, uh, then I came up to the very obvious, maybe now obvious conclusion that hey, this is not a flat sample anymore. So when I was measuring graphene boron nitride or molybdenum sulfide. In most cases, I was working with the epitaxial materials uh, or at least transferred materials. And their total area was, in case when considering the SIMS technique, th this total area was huge. So I was easily able to uh, get the information from the regions like 200 times 200 microns. But in this case, we have some 
it's very small particles. The diameter is like just few microns deposited on the silicon substrate. And okay, we don't see it on the optical image, but the actual height of these uh, particles is again uh, in, in the range of one or two microns. So this is not a flat sample. And then I realized that how the SIMS work, uh, it couldn't be registered because these particles can disturb the whole measurement. So the thing is that when we are trying to make the SIMS analysis, we also apply the high voltage to the sample holder, holder or as we usually say, to the sample surface itself. So when we apply such a voltage and when you are thinking that we have some additional particles all around and when you are trying to think how the electric field may look like in such a system, this is not easy anymore when compared to any flat samples. So at that point, I realized that this is not, not just the extraction parameters that I have to take care of, but also the primary beam can be deflected because of these uh, disturbances in the electric field. So as you remember, I used the, the, the impact energy of these primary ions was just 100 dV. So it was so low that it could be easily, um, um, the, the, this primary beam could be easily deflected. So at that point, I realized I have to make the tune, tuning very uh, properly, not only caring about the uh, extraction parameters, but also about the uh, primary beam. And then I did so, and here is the result. Okay, now we can, now we are getting some, somewhere because at least we can register all the uh, all these signals. Uh, what you can actually see that the intensity of these signals is very low because um, usually something okay, one thousand counts is already not bad, uh, but anything below it's way too uh, um, too low for the proper proper analysis uh, in this case. But nevertheless, even these uh, signals that have a slightly higher intensity, all of them are are very uh, very noisy. So, but they are finally visible. So this is already a progress. And I can also mention that this is not actually surprising anymore because here I knew already what is happening because I made this uh, extraction optimization only for a single, um, uh, single element. Actually, I based it on a silicon um, a test uh, sample. This is what we normally you, uh, do in the SEMS analysis. However, in this specific case, it doesn't work like this anymore. So here I would like to show you that in the classical sims, this is the this uh, uh, left uh, hand side uh, picture, uh, it doesn't actually matter which element we use for the secondary ions uh, extraction. Because even if we use it for the silicon, on the silicon test samples, we just lose a few uh, percent of the intensity. Of course, the highest one is always obtained when the uh, for the carbon signal, for example, when it's optimized for a sample that do contain carbon and so on. But we only lose uh, just a few percent. However, in this specific uh, conditions that I showed you before, uh, you can't do it like this anymore. The uh, extraction parameters for each um, element has to be optimized on a sample that do contain this element. Otherwise, we lose two or three orders of magnitude of the intensity of these signals. So uh, this, as I said, al I already knew it from my past experience. So I simply apply it. So I took the silicon carbide uh, for and uh, graphite for the carbon, uh, sapphire for oxygen, aluminum, and titanium, uh, just a piece of uh, metallic titanium to optimize the extraction parameters for all these uh, ions. And with this changed, this is the actual outcome. Uh, so first of all, which I would like you to emphasize that we obtained the much higher intensities, but please also note that I changed the scale. First, I was showing you the uh, plot that was starting with just one count. Now I'm, cu now I'm cutting this plot from the 1000 counts just to make it uh, uh, looking better. So as you can see, the intensity of the signals is already much higher, so we can already start working with them. However, 
the signals to noise ratio is a little bit better, especially for signals like like carbon. Uh, but it's still we don't see any any atomic depth resolution here. But the question is, is that so? So here, uh, actually, this is again uh, something that took me some time. But once I was able to register something very interesting, and this is shown here. So this is very similar to the picture uh, to the previous plot that I shown you, but the difference here is the that the carbon signal looks quite differently. You can see that there are like two always two peaks and uh, it's uh, periodically uh, appearing again and again. Uh, so we can imagine that if this is the carbon and carbon layer, we can have the titanium layer here, here and here. Here in the middle we have uh, aluminum and again titanium, titanium and titanium. So this is actually showing that we are really approaching this um, atomic depth resolution already. Um, but the problem is that it was not reproducible at all. Uh, I was able to register it just once, uh, but at that point, um, I wasn't frustrated anymore. This was actually a great feeling to, to, to see this uh, carbon, uh, carbon peaks, because then I realized, okay, this is, this was just luck uh, that I saw something like this. So let us optimize this experiment that will obtain a atomic depth resolution by design, not by luck. Uh, okay, so my question here was, why only register it for carbon? And here I actually included uh, more different uh, analytical technique and we concluded that there can be some leftovers contaminants like titanium oxide on top of these uh, max uh, particles. Uh, we could detect them with the XRD, for example, or, or FTR. Uh, okay, so, and that, again, uh, got me thinking. Because when, when I mentioned that I was working with the epitaxial materials, it was quite obvious that the area that was available for the analysis was huge. So even if there was some contaminant left over anywhere, uh, it didn't really affect much uh, the outcome because uh, simply the intensity of the other regions were uh, much higher than this small little uh, problematic uh, position. But for max and maxim samples, they are so small that any leftover on the surface will actually disturb the whole experiment. So then I designed something that I call, called ion polishing. So it basically looked like this, that I'm using much higher energy of these primary ions, uh, still keeping the same incident angle, but I also apply additional offset voltage that is actually uh, pushing away this uh, ion and uh, preventing him from reaching the surface of a sample. And then actually this uh, ion will move almost parallel to the sample surface, so it will not uh, introduce any damage to it. But if there is any residual contamination present on this, this, this will collide with this uh, contaminant directly and will simply, as you can see, the, the erode it and clean it from the surface. So with that ion polishing procedure, I was able to prepare the uh, max and later maxins particles for the SIMS analysis. And this is something I obtained here. Okay, we clearly see that there is some a lot of noise uh, happening here. Uh, but first of all, this result is fully reproducible. Now you can see that these two carbon peaks are actually blurred together. We can see a cl very clear separation when we are expecting uh, titanium, aluminum, and titanium. Uh, there is some indication of the oxygen that maybe it looks like a double peak here. Uh, but this is still not perfect. Uh, it's quite uh, nice to actually realize that uh, the aluminum signal was almost gone from this analysis. We only detect some very like uh, sp uh, large spikes over here where the aluminum was actually supposed to be. But you can see that this is very, uh, very noisy. So what was the reason of it? I realized that uh, during the SIMS analysis uh, in the instrument I'm using, I can't measure all these uh, signals at the same time. I have to cycle through them. 
So uh, I have to integrate the carbon signal, oxygen signal, aluminum signal, and titanium signal. I set them for the integration time for two seconds. And I realize it may simply happen that for this sample that is, we have the like atomically thin layers within, uh, I can measure a wrong signal where I'm in the position where I should detect the aluminum. So then I decided that I have to uh, do something else. The standard cycle will not work uh, good enough for this. So that is why I devised something that I call the super cycle. In this case, uh, I'm measuring the, all these signals for a very short amount of time as shown here. Uh, I'm cy cycling through them. Uh, as you can see, I included two times uh, oxygen and aluminum step because these signals were the most noisy one. And then I actually integrated five such as simple cycles to form one super cycle. So, okay, I obviously increased the uh, total um, acquisition time just a little bit by introduction of this oxygen, additional oxygen aluminum signals. So I had to decrease the energy of the uh, primary ion a bit. Uh, but it actually made a huge difference. Now you can see that we actually, and again, this is a fully reproducible result, but now we really have a, a fully perfect, maybe not perfect yet, but very nice atomic depth resolution. So we can see a double peak of carbon separated. Here we can see this three titanium peaks and separated but one uh, aluminum peak. There is, however, one problem here. I'm not uh, yet concerned about the oxygen present here, but about these huge peaks uh, where the aluminum is supposed to be. Uh, I was very concerned because the actual uh, ratio of these two um, signals is much higher than the ratio registered for a sapphire. So it was uh, something was really clearly wrong here. So then I realized again, that there is a problem uh, with these samples that are only small particles. Uh, so I realized that typically in the SIMS experiment, we are scanning the material with the primary beam. We are rastering the primary beam over a larger area. Uh, but in this case, we can set the size of the primary beam to be bigger than the particle itself. So then I realized that this movement of the primary um, ion beam may introduce a lot of this, uh, this noise and particularly it, it can actually uh, move the oxygen which was present on the very surface of the silicon substrate to be incorporated between these max layers and introduced in the, this aluminum layer. I'm not quite sure if this is the uh, correct explanation but I did realize that we can make the measurement with the uh, beam, which is much bigger than the particle itself. So it's like here. And when we position it far from the edge of this, uh, of this particle, because the ions will come from the left-hand side, uh, then we can make this uh, measurement without any rastering, so without any movement of this beam, because this is bigger from the uh, particle. And we will not sputter it from the site in this case of this positioning. And then we simply can choose the region of interest to keep us away from the edges of the, uh, of the particle. And actually, this, um, this change uh, led me to the final result and actually solved the problem. So now you can see that this oxygen, uh, oxygen signal within the aluminum layer uh, was much lower. And furthermore, the actual quality of all the other signals increased quite dramatically as well. So in this case, we were uh, able to, to estimate that the uh, oxygen concentration within this layer is about 1%. So it was uh, quite uh, realistic. So, okay, we get the better quality and we clearly get a very perfect atomic depth resolution. There is no, absolutely no doubt about it. Even for the, these two titanium layers, which are only separated by this aluminum layer, the difference is uh, more than half an order of magnitude. And of course, this result is fully reproducible. So I was able to, to, to measure them, uh, any max or maxing samples from now on. 
Uh, obviously, what you can see already and what the title of the um, uh, this uh, article in Nature Nanotechnology already suggests is the key finding of the work is that we register the oxygen uh, exactly at the position where the carbon uh, layers are present. So actually, we showed that these materials, the maxines, are not transitional metal carbides, but actually oxycarbides. And we show it that for conventional both max and maxine samples, we always detect a lot of uh, oxygen within the carbon layers. And then after the etching of these A layers, uh, the situation, oh, okay, we do also get, now we do get a uh, very high intensity of the oxygen signal here because this is the termination layers of maxines, but we also detect, always detect this oxygen uh, within the carbon layers. And this is up to 30% uh, of these uh, layers is composed of uh, oxygen. So this is clearly not a carbide material anymore. Uh, however, in the... Uh, advanced synthesis uh, procedure also developed uh, at Drexel University, where for the MAX precursor, they used uh, the excess of aluminum. We actually were able to show that these two materials, they do not contain any oxygen uh, at all within the uh, carbon layers. And then after the etching, the maxine actually inherits the same uh, property, that the, this is a pure uh, carbide material. And since we are getting some questions, this is clearly not related to the surface uh, oxidation because we were also uh, perform an experiment that we uh, first, we sputtered like a half a micron of the material and they expose it to air to see how it is oxidizing. And first of all, we showed that this material is oxidizing much faster because we had to keep this one, this with this enhanced procedure for much longer time to detect some uh, oxygen already incorporating into the just a very few uh, uh, surface layers. But here we can see that uh, the oxygen was already incorporated present in this carbon uh, layers prior to the analysis. So now we actually know that this is not caused by the surface oxidations, but these materials are true uh, oxycarbides and okay we show it uh, not only for for the materials that were synthesized with the at the Drexel University we are able to show it for the materials we uh, we purchased from uh, different vendors as you can see here and we show uh, proved actually that only these materials produced with this uh, excess aluminum uh, synthesis procedures they do not have any oxygen in this uh, carbon layers everything else contain sometimes different uh, oxygen concentration both the max uh, uh, samples and and maxines they're always oxycarbides and not carbides Okay, but we are also able to uh, determine the composition of the termination layers. So in here, we uh, actually use the something that I'm uh, uh, called the signal anchoring. So uh, first you saw that this oxygen peak at the termination layers was a single peak, which was actually coming from two termination layers. It was blurred together. So here I did not measure the oxygen or HO uh, or fluorine or chlorine uh, signal, but I actually attach it to titanium. So it was either the top one or the bottom one. So when I changed this, uh, how the specific ion I measured, I was actually able to separate these two termination layers. So this is the experimental data. It can be perfectly reproduced with the two Gaussians. So now you can see that the composition of the termination layers can be precisely determined. And now you can also see that even two neighboring layers can have a drastically different composition, the upper one containing more fluorine and the lower one, the uh, oxygen and OH uh, groups. So you can see that the compositions uh, of these termination layers tend to fluctuate a lot, and it's quite different for the pure carb carbide material and uh, oxycarbide material. Last but not least, uh, we are also able to measure some out-of-plane ordered max and maxine samples. In here you have the 
molybdenum, titanium, aluminum. Um, okay, this is also an uh, oxycarbide. We don't show the uh, oxygen signals here, but trust us, they, they, they do contain it. Uh, and the chromium uh, with titanium. In both cases, the idea was that only the outer layer should be composed of either uh, molybdenum or chromium, whereas the middle one should contain only titanium. And you can see that the perfect simulation, uh, perfect separation was is present for the molybdenum uh, sample, whereas for the chromium sample, we do see that there is a very clear uh, leftover chromium in the middle layer as well, up to 10%. So basically, it's changing the properties of this uh, material. And in this way, we are actually able to, to solve some problem why this material do not show the uh, some magnetic properties that were aimed and the solution is this is because the chromium is also incorporated in this middle uh, layer uh, clearly we need some more simulations to to determine wh why chromium is incorporated in this middle layer whereas molybdenum is always uh, perfectly ordered in this uh, outer layers uh, but we do obtain the tool to determine such uh, uh, changes in the composition so just a short conclusion and of my talk and some future directions. So first, you saw that uh, I'm using the state-of-the-art instrument. I'm running some dedicated procedures, which are definitely time-consuming, but now I think I'm convinced you that they are really worth it. And in this way, we can analyze 2D materials with the atomic depth resolution. And so for max and maxing samples, we were able to achieve this atomic uh, layer by layer char characterization. We are able to show that uh, most of these uh, maxing materials are actually oxycarbides. And we believe that it will be the same story with uh, nitrites, that they will not be nitrites, but actually oxynitrites. Uh, we are able to, uh, to show the perfect tool for the analysis of the termination layers. We now also continue working with this because here we showed you some randomly um, distribution of this uh, termination layers, random co composition. Whereas in many cases, Maxins have some designed uh, composition of these termination layers, so we can easily analyze them with the SIMS technique. Uh, we saw that we can easily uh, work with the out-of-plane order materials. Uh, in the near future, we want to work also with the higher entropy maxines, where several um, uh, transition metals are present in the sample and not, uh, not ordered as before. Uh, we do want to use the technique for the hydrogen detection in the maxine samples, because the SIMS uh, can really detect um, hydrogen. Uh, then we also uh, want to continue with the intercalation study because we know that it is possible to introduce some materials between the maxins layers. So we would like to continue our, uh, our work with, in this direction as well. And most possibly there will be um, some other, uh, other questions and problems to solve with the SIMS technique. But the very general conclusion of my presentation is that SIMS can be successfully used for 2D materials. And please mind, this is not only for Maxines, but other as well. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm waiting for your questions in the Q&A um, session. And if you have any question uh, at some um, time in the future, uh, you can always write an email. Uh, so I will gladly answer any of your questions. Thank you very much.